If you have a Bible, you can meet me in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple steps back into last week's sermon just by way of introduction, and then we're going to get into our text for today. We're going to go all the way into chapter 10, all right? So it's going to be quite uh, extensive. Hear these words of our Father. Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 11 it says, But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow sprinkling those who are defiled sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God? Therefore, verse 15 says, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance because a death has taken place for the redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Where a will exists, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will is valid only when people die since it is never in effect while the one who made it is still living. I hope that makes sense. Right? A will comes into effect once the person has died. That means if you want to inherit something, someone has to die. Keep that in your back pocket. Verse 18. That is why even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when every command had been proclaimed by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the new covenant that God has ordained for you. In the same way, he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship with blood. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. He did not do these to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this judgment, so also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Still with me? Chapter 10. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices by continually offering year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, You did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, See, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, God. After he says above, you do not desire or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. He then says, see, I have come to do your will. He, he takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. 
He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who were sanctified. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For after he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days. The Lord says, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these there is no longer an offering for sin. What a mouthful. There's a lot going on here. There is, there's a lot going on here, which we've come to know is normal with the book of Hebrews. But what sticks out the most is the blood. There is a lot of death and blood in this text. I mean, the the word blood appears 12 times. I read it 12 times in these passages. In fact, verses 19 to 21 say this. For when every command had been proclaimed by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop and sprinkled the scroll itself And all the people, did y'all catch that? Saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God has ordained for you. In the same way, he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship with blood. What the writer of Hebrews is saying here comes from what God instructed Moses to do all the way back in Exodus chapter 24. Let me read it to you, verses 3 to eight. It says, Moses came and told the people all the commands of the Lord and all the ordinances. Then all the people responded with a single voice, we will do everything that the Lord has commanded. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early the next morning and set up an altar and 12 pillars of the 12 tribes of Israel at the base of the mountain. Then he sent out young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and set it in basins. The other half of the blood he splattered on the altar. He then took the covenant scroll and read it aloud to the people, and they responded, we will do and obey all the Lord has commanded. Moses took the blood, splattered it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. There was blood everywhere. He'd be getting emails today. If Moses was around, he'd be like, what on earth is going on? There is blood everywhere. Why? Well, it's, it's because of what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 9. He says, according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. See, this was the requirement for the forgiveness of sins. Still seems a bit extreme, though. I mean, blood everywhere, everywhere. I mean, the tabernacle probably looked like a murder scene. And if you've got your Jesus glasses on, then that should make sense. Hashtag the cross. But it's, it's this way because our sin is a big deal. Well, why is there so much blood? Well, it's because our sin is a big deal. And there can be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Our sin is a big deal. Your sin and my sin and humanity's sin, big deal, big issue. It's a huge offense to a holy God. And so can we take a few moments to talk a little bit about our sin? It's about to get super uncomfortable in here. Because I know this is a topic most people don't like to get into. Oh, we love to talk about the grace of God. We love to talk about the gifts that God gives his church. We, we love to talk about all these, these beautiful things, but, but we, we never really want to get into sin. Like, maybe just mention it once, and that's enough. On it, I get it. But do you really? There was blood 
everywhere. See, we, we, have, we have to talk about sin. We have to understand our sin. If we want to truly grasp the beauty of God's grace, we must recognize the depravity of our sin. Cornelius Plantiga, an American theologian, says this. The sober truth is that without a full disclosure of sin, the gospel of grace becomes impertinent, unnecessary, and finally uninteresting. And that's so true. I mean, we look at the church today. Yes, we are imperfect, but, but the way that we deal with sin, it's almost like, oh, well, it's... You know, that's just kind of how we are. Just carry on. Just move along. There was blood everywhere. So let's talk about sin. Psalm 32 verse 5 says this. I love this psalm. It says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, in this one verse, we see sin, iniquity, and transgressions. All of them are mentioned. Basically, the, the, the three words communicate the same idea. Evil and lawlessness. As defined by God in John, 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 4, it says, uh, Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. Every, everyone who sins is break. Like, you may not know all of God's law, but if you sin, you are breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. We all practice lawlessness. All of us. And so if the, if the kingdom of God was a western, we'd all have a bounty on our heads. Sin, sin, simply means we have missed the mark, right? Like, like what, what is, oh no, what is, you, might, you might be new to all of this. Oh no, what is sin? Like, I hear people talk about it all the time, but what is it? Sin simply means you, you and I, have missed the mark. A another way to say it is that we have fallen short of the glory of God. Sin leads to trespassing. A, a trespasser is someone who crosses a line or climbs a fence that he or she should not cross or climb. A, a, a trespass may be intentional or unintentional. So that means you, like, you, don't, you don't even have to know the law and still be a trespasser. The law is the law, friends. Whether you Know it or you don't. The law is the law. And sin causes us to, to, to gravitate naturally towards selfishness, towards envy, and towards pride. If you're trying to figure out why, why is there so much selfishness in this world? Why so much pride? Why so much evil? Sin. I say this often. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll make you stay longer than you want to stay, and it'll make you pay more than you can afford. Every single time. Sin also leads to brokenness. Sin leads to brokenness. Uh, this word iniquity, iniquity, iniquity is defined as being wicked or immoral in a nature or character. It leads to brokenness. It, 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 it primarily indicates, this word iniquity primarily indicates not so much an action, but the character of an action. We all know this. There are a lot of broken systems and structures in this world. We don't have to go too far to see them. There's tons. There's tons of broken systems and structures in this world. If you look behind those, you'll find an evil character. Systems and structures, they, they don't just pop up. Someone has to create them. S someone has to bring them into being. And if you look closely enough, you'll find an evil character. Like, like you'll find iniquity. You'll find brokenness. And friends, I am guilty of that. 
Like I'll try to figure out like how, how can this be to my benefit? Let me build this thing. Let me set this thing up so that it's to my benefit and my benefit only. This word iniquity in the Hebrew is the word avon. And it's used to describe a, a, a distorted or crooked road. See this in Lamentations chapter 9. It's used to describe a, a deformed back that's bent out of shape. If your back is bent out of shape, that means your perspective will always be from this angle. And so everything is like this. And so if your character is evil, then, then everything that you do is from that angle. This is why sin is so dangerous. It's so dangerous, even in the church. Iniquity leads to crooked results and consequences. The suffering of people, shattered relationships, a culture of hate and revenge, and so on, and so on, and so on. When, when, we, are, when we are abused and taken advantage of, we are experiencing this Hebrew word, avon, we are experiencing iniquity. The brokenness that sin brings. Let's keep going. Sin, sin is rebellious. Sin is rebellious. The, the word transgressions points us to this. The, the Hebrew word for transgressions is, is pesha. It's a really cool word, in my opinion, right? Like you can be out there. You are, you are performing pesha. Stop peshaing. Pesh, pesha. Pesha. This is to violate a law, to commit a crime, to willfully disobey. Re rebellion leads to the breaking of trust, a lack of faithfulness, a lack of integrity. It leads to painful experiences that, that harm everyone who is involved. Sin is rebellious. Why so much rebellion in the world? Sin. Here's another one. I'm going to have fun with this one. <clears throat> sin is foolish. Sin is foolish. Like w w when studying this text and I got to this one, I was like, man, is there a way that I can get around this one? No. Sin is, sin is foolish. Psalm 107 verse 17 says this. Some were fools through their sinful ways. And because of their iniquities, suffered affliction. First Chronicles chapter 21 verse 8 says, David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done these, uh, this thing. Now please take away your servant's guilt, for I have been very, very foolish. Doesn't sound great saying it, right? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 26, he says, But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. How many times have you not done what Jesus says you should do? I'm not saying it. <laughs> Jesus is saying you're foolish. Proverbs 26, verse 11. This one hits hard. As a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. Let's look at that one together. As a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. I mean, I don't know everyone in here, but permit me to assume this about everyone in here. We all naturally turn away from this. Like when you see a dog eating up its own, like we all, there's, there's something in us that goes, mmm. <laughs> and, and yet we're told here, when you repeat, when you repeat the things that, that, that you, you do that you shouldn't be doing, because Jesus says don't do that, it's, it's foolish because it leads to a life of death. He's like, you're being foolish. C can I give you some, some synonyms for the word foolish? 
Rhetorical question. Uh, I ask them all the time. Stupid. Silly. Idiotic. Half-witted. Brainless. Mindless. Thoughtless. Incautious. Irresponsible. Unwise. Unintelligent. Unreasonable. Ill-advised. Reckless. Lunatic. Absurd. Senseless. Pointless. Nonsensical. Here's my favorite one. Dumb. <laughs> Sin is dumb. It is. It, ju- it just is. It's, it's dumb. And so, and so w- what is the Bible saying to us? Don't be dumb. Don't be foolish. A- and we do this all the time. We do this all the time. Let me give you some examples. If you are a Christian, which means you've surrendered your life to Jesus, that he is now your Lord and Savior, then do not get into a relationship with someone who is not a Christian. The Bible is clear on this. And like, I've heard it all, the the amount of, of scriptural gymnastics that people must do to be able to be like, you know, but, but, I'm like, that's foolish. And I know sometimes it sounds harsh, but, but like, you know when you get to that point, you're talking to someone, you're like, man, I just wish that you would get this. I just, like, stop doing this. Like, it, that, that's, that's what you should be hearing. And not just from me, but my hope is that you would hear from God's word, because God is going, you were not made for this. Don't, don't be foolish. Like, it doesn't mean that we don't understand how difficult it is and how challenging it is. Yes, we understand. This world is massively challenging to live in, especially as a Christian. But we have everything that we need to be able to navigate through it. So don't be foolish. Here's another one. I did one for our single folks. Let's talk a little bit about our married folks. If you're married and you know, and you know things aren't going great in your marriage, do you know what's foolish? Is, is to go, you know, let's just ignore it. Let's not talk about it. Let's not invite people into it and say, hey, c- c- can you speak into this thing? Like, let's, let's, just, let's just leave it alone. I'm sure it, it, it'll, it'll be okay. That's, that's foolish. That's unwise. Let me pick another one. Maybe it might be like, oh, no, foolish. Don't call me that. That is reckless. Because you know what happens. If you just, if you, th- those issues are like weeds in our marriage. If there was, I don't know, I don't know if there's a business for weeds. And I'm not talking about the weeds that you think I'm talking about. I'm talking about, like, some, some of you guys, man, I pray for you so much. You'll leave, you'll be like, man, Roots is amazing. They were talking about weeds and, no. I'm talking about those things that kill your plants and your flowers. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's a business for it. I don't know. I don't know if people are out there going, hey, we, we sell weeds. I don't know if that's happening at Woolworths. I don't know. But if there was, if there was, I would definitely invest in it. I tell my wife immediately, sell the house. We're putting everything that we have into it. People are buying weeds. <laughs> it's the easiest way to make money. Why? Because here's what you do. You put weeds there, and then you do... Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And then what happens? Those things grow. And they take over your garden. They take over everything. Married folk, when you, when you have issues in your marriage and you go, I'm sure it'll go away. What could have been a really great lunch, maybe a coffee, a couple prayers. Okay, you're on your way. We're out here trying to slay giants, praying in the whatevers. Because like, do you know what I'm saying? And, and don't do that. Now, now, you might go, oh my goodness, that's where I am. Like, I'm a single person, <laughs> I'm in a relationship, or here's my, or, or whatever it is for you. I mean, we could, have, we could have spoken about living beyond your means. If that's you, go cut up your credit card now. Now. It's a word from the Lord. <laughs> 
We, we could have spoken about a number of things. If that's you, hear this. Don't, don't, don't be like, oh, well, then I've got, like, well, I guess my life is just horrible. No, no, no. There is, there is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. Amen. And so there is grace. There is grace. Like this word is grace. Is God going, hold on. I can still do a thing. I can still do a thing. If, if, if Jesus can bring a dead man to life, your credit is nothing if you will step in his direction. Amen. Whatever broken, it's nothing if you will step. And then if you trust him, you gather people around you, you say, let's pray. Let's, let's trust Jesus for big things. Do that. Don't be foolish. Sin, sin, sin is dumb. Here's another one. Sin, sin leads to corruption. See, sin's goal it is to take everything that is good. That's its goal. It's, it's one of its goals. It's, it's, it's to take everything that is good and, and to affect it in such a way that at the end, you're looking at something and you're going, I, I'm not 100% sure that that was the original thing. Like, what is that? It'll take that which was beautiful and make it so, so, so unrecognizable. And you know what? It takes a little bit of sin. See, some of us, are, we think, you know what, no, 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 we're still good. We're still good. It's just a little bit. We're okay. It takes a little bit of sin. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Paul, Paul is, is calling out the church in Corinth for their sexual immorality. And then in the latter part of, of verse 6, he says, don't you realize that sin is like a, a little yeast? Just a little. Just a little. That spreads throughout the whole batch of dough. It, it, it's like a little cancer. I've never heard anyone go, yo, I just, I, I came back from the doctor. They said, I got, it's a little cancer. It's not too bad. I think we caught it in time. But you know what? I'm just going to chill. Like, I'm okay. Are you going to go back for another appointment? No, no, I'm good. I'm just, it's just a little bit. Don't even have to think about it. It's just a little bit. No, because cancer spreads. It spreads. It wants to take over Everything, that's what sin does. It, it's, it's, like, it's like sex. Okay, you guys are cool with it. Okay, cool. I, know. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I hadn't prepped. I was like, oh, because, you know, church doesn't love to talk about sex. It's like money. It's like, oh, we don't talk about it. Just leave that one alone. Let's talk about all these other things. Friends, sex is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's been created by God absolutely beautiful to, to be enjoyed in the context of marriage between one man and one woman. Now, I know that that's not popular today. I don't know. I might get some emails. It's okay. It's not popular today to, to preach that, to say that. But here's the thing. We don't preach popular. We preach the Word of God. And, and I'm thankful that we still live in a context where that's that's still allowed, but I don't know for how much longer. And so get equipped, Christian. If it's not already difficult in the context that you work in, it's about to. But we preach the word of God. We preach the truth. Because it leads to life. Why would I preach something that leads to death? Why would I give you something that leads to death? That's dangerous. You get away from that. And so just a little bit of sin. And now we have this industry that is so massive, we don't know what to do with it. It's called pornography. They've taken that which was good, that which was created by God. You let sin in. You let it mess around a little bit, and before you know it, it's taken over. Now it's like, I, I can't even recognize this thing. What is this? Sin leads to corruption. Let me give you one more. And it's probably the most important one. Sin is and leads to death. Sin is and leads to death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. Death, James chapter 1, uh, verse 14 to 15 says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. 
these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, do you see that word? Allowed to grow. What sin are you allowing to grow in your life? And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth not to prosperity, not to joy, not to life everlasting. That's what it'll promise you. But what it delivers on is death. Friends, do you guys know Satan's uh, mission statement? Jesus gave it to us. So it's not like we we can't even be like, oh, I don't even know what Satan's trying to do. No, no, Jesus gave us Satan's mission statement. John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, the thief comes only. Only. Not sometimes, not, okay, you're okay, you know, because you're educated, but he's going for, no, 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 no. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Only. Now, he's going to come in in different ways, in shiny things, in pretty things. But he, he only, only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Sin is and leads to death. And my friends, we have a sin problem. Everything that I've just mentioned to you, We have that problem. I have that problem. So this leads to the question, how can we be saved from such a gruesome reality? I hope that that would be your question. How? How how can we be saved from such a gruesome reality? And let me save you some trouble of coming up with some of your own ideas. (laughs) There is no amount of work on your part that can remedy this situation. There's no amount of work on your part that can remedy this situation. There's no amount of money, no amount of intellect, no amount of connections, no amount of sacrifice on your part, not even your own death can remedy the situation. Sin to be defeated needs an acceptable sacrifice. And you and I do not have that. Not in our own abilities, not in our words, not in our power, not in our bank accounts, nothing. Whatever you say or do will never be acceptable because, hear this, because before Jesus, we are dead in our sin. All of us are dead in our sin. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. This is the condition of every human being before they encounter Jesus. We are dead And a dead sacrifice cannot quench death. It cannot pay the debt we owe. Only that which is living. This is why for for, for a brief moment, the the goats and bulls were were somewhat acceptable. They they were the trailer attraction. They they were the intro. They they were the appetizer. But they, they couldn't fulfill that which we needed. Only the living. I mean, even as a society and a culture, we know this. You don't have to be a Christian to know this. We know this. When we make sacrifices, culturally, when we, when we make sacrifices, it requires the living to be put to death, to be offered up for the required outcome. And so for eternal salvation, we have already been told that the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow is not sufficient. It only purifies the flesh. We spoke about this last week. We need a purification of the soul to be freed from sin and its implications. A purification of the soul. And this can only be done not just by a living sacrifice, but by a perfect sacrifice. To, to, to have our debt paid, to be free from sin, to gain eternal life, to access the Father, the shedding of blood that represents death must occur. Remember Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, where it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And, and this forgiveness of sin is what we desperately need, all of us. 
It's what we desperately need. This is what Jesus accomplishes for us. This is what we preach week in and week out. This is why Jesus matters, because he's the only one, the only one that can do this for us. And that's the whole point of our text today. It's that Jesus recognized the problem that dead people cannot offer up anything to pay the debt owed. In fact, even animals cannot satisfy what is owed. Only the sinless living can do this mighty deed. And throughout all of history, there's only been one. And his name is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. This act of sacrifice by Jesus is called, here, big word, atonement. Atonement. The Hebrew word for atonement is kapur, which means two things, to repay a debt and to purify. Atonement. And that's what the whole sacrificial system was about. The whole sacrificial system was all about atonement, communicating to us this, this beautiful act that Jesus would accomplish. Someone must set this right. Someone must clear the account and pay the debt. The problem was that in the old covenant, the sacrificial system was not enough. It was merely pointing to the coming of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 to 4 says this, Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continue to offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered, since the worshiper, worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It is impossible. They had to keep coming back year after year after year. It, it, was, like, it was like having a, a lot of credit on your credit card, like a lot of debt on your credit card, and then just paying the minimum every month. That's the sacrificial system. The Old Testament sacrificial system is I got, I got all this debt, but you know what I'm doing is just paying the minimum. Never really dealing with the principle. See, the reality is that you're actually not paying down the debt. That's what the Old Covenant sacrificial system was because it's impossible for the, bulls, the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now, now I know it's easy to look at this and go, no worries. I don't struggle with this, Honor. I have no plans to offer the blood of bulls and goats. <laughs> I hope you're saying that. And so you would think, no, I'm off the hook. But you see, if you're trying to take away your sin or clear your guilt with anything else other than the finished work of Jesus Christ, then this is for you. You see, you cannot attend church enough to pay for your sin. You cannot pray enough. You cannot read your Bible enough. You cannot do good deeds enough. You cannot, you cannot give away enough money. There is nothing that you can do to pay what you owe. This is the point that the writer of Hebrews is leading us to. Do you know why the Bible refers to the separation of God as eternal? It's et eternal separation. If you do not surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you, you will be eternally separated from God the Father. Why, why is it eternal? Well, it's because you cannot fully quench the wrath of God. You, you just can't. Tr trying to pay what we owe God is like trying to take a 25-liter container with holes in it, going to the ocean, and then trying to fill that up with a teaspoon. Yes, and it's meant to be ridiculous. Be because if you're trying to, to, to pay what you owe with anything other than the finished work of Christ, then that's you. That is what you were doing. But you might be sitting here and asking the question, gosh, this seems intense. Why can't God just give us a pass? All this blood, like walking into the tablet and going, man, this is a lot of blood. And you're sprinkling it on the people? God, I think you're being a little bit too much. Just give me a pass. I just, like, I just lied. That's all I did. It was just a lie. And then we add interesting adjectives to it and think that makes it better. Why can't he just give us a pass? It seems like it would be easier for him to do that. 
So if, if not just for me, like surely, God, for you, it would be way, way, way easier for you to just, just let it go. Why are you going to send your son, live a perfect life? Why all these things? Just let it go. Well, while I hear you and maybe might come to that conclusion, God can't do that because it'd be like a, a judge presiding over a murder case. And while he has all the evidence in front of him, clearly showing that that person is guilty, that person did it, to then go, it's okay. Don't worry about it, just go. But, but judge, he, 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 he killed. She, she did that. No, 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 don't worry about it, just go. It's, it's totally fine, I'll give you a pass. We would all say that that judge is corrupt. We would all say that that judge is evil. That he or she has committed a great injustice. Well, that's the point. God is a just God. He's just. He, he cannot just simply let it go by. He is perfectly just. He cannot give us a pass. It would contradict his very nature. He wouldn't be God. Now, while I recognize that all this may seem heavy, it's a heavy Sunday, I feel heavy. I'm like, man, this is intense. I feel that it's important that we address this. Remember the words of Cornelius Plantiga. The sober truth is that without a full disclosure of sin, the gospel of grace becomes impertinent, unnecessary, and finally uninteresting. This, this is why we must sit in this. We must sit in this. We must feel the weight and the responsibility of our sin so that we can feel the freedom of sin. We must admit our need for an atoning sacrifice. Only then can we understand what we really need is the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. See, our sin demands the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our substitutionary atonement because he steps in our place. He is our atonement because he makes us right with God. This is the good news. It's the gospel. We have fallen short. We have broken the relationship with God. We have rebelled. We are the ones who are corrupt. We have introduced death and therefore earned death. However, Jesus perfectly obeyed the law. He perfectly obeyed the law as our substitute. And he came under the condemnation of the law as our substitute, as if he had broken it. And only Jesus could do this. Only he could take the full judgment of God. R remember that illustration that I gave you about taking a 25-liter container, going to the ocean and trying to fill it. It's got holes in the bottom with a teaspoon. Yeah. Never going to work. Well, Jesus, who is fully God, he is like a divine sponge. Shows up at the ocean, gets in and just... <laughs> he can do it. He can soak up God's judgment. He can because he's God. That's why he's the perfect substitute, but also because he's fully man. This is why goats and bulls were not enough. We can't identify with them, and I know we try. We live in a world where it's like, oh, no, no. Your puppy is just your puppy. It's cute, it's amazing, but it's just a puppy. We needed a, a human being to step in our place who understands us who can stand as our representative. You know what this is? It's like being in a courtroom and the judge, he's looking over you. He's got all the evidence in front of him. And the evidence shows that you are a murderous, adulterous liar. And you're going, no, no I'm not. And then he points to the TV screen and he goes, there you are doing the act. And you go, judge, that's not me. And then we hear over the TV screen, hi, it's me on air committing these acts. <laughs> and then he goes, guilty. That seems fair. Guilty. And, and so they, they put the chains on me, and now they're, they're, they're leading me to the cell. And in that moment, someone at the back goes, you're on a stop. And the courtroom goes, dead silent. And Jesus stands up, and he goes, I would like to take the place of honor. And everyone's going, but, but Jesus, you, you did nothing wrong. 
And he says, I know. But I love Oni. And I don't want Oni to go there. And so I will go in his place. And I am the acceptable sacrifice because I have committed no wrong, no sin, no rebellion. There is no corruption in me. And the judge goes, well, that, that seems acceptable. Friends, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. And if at any moment you ever think of yourself more than that person standing there guilty of every single charge, then you don't understand your sin. And I get it. We'll be like, but Oni, I'm a good person. I say this all the time. Compared to who? Like we say that in comparison to, 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 to I won't say the name. Leave that one alone, Oni. We compare ourselves to people who, who are serving life sentences. Yeah, obviously you are way better than that person. But they're not the standard. Jesus is. He is our substitutionary, substitutionary, oh, substitutionary atonement. Thank you, Mrs. Zinth, my high school English teacher. Friends, this is why we need Jesus as our faithful and merciful high priest. That's the drum that the writer of Hebrews has been beating repeatedly over and over and over and over again. We need Jesus as our faithful and merciful high priest. And that's the point of our texts this morning. That as you go back and, and look at it, that, that my, my hope is that now you would have, you have a framework of why all of this is happening. Let me close with this. I've said a lot about sin. I've said a lot about Jesus being the acceptable sacrifice. Well, let me briefly talk about some of the benefits of Jesus being our substitutionary atonement. And I'll be quick. Benefit number one. We've preached this one before in our series, We're All Theologians. Here's one of the benefits of surrendering our lives to Jesus. Number one is propitiation. Big word, but a beautiful word. Propitiation. It simply means a price that satisfies. Propitiation is the, the appeasing of God's wrath. The, the, the prefix pro, you can just come here a sermon today, doing a little English language. The prefix pro means to put something forward. There, there is a debt that is owed. There is a price to be paid, and, and the only one that can pay it is Jesus. He died and rose from the grave, and that... That counted for you. If you believe that that counted for you, then you will be saved. If you believe that that was put forward for you as a payment for your penalty, then you will be saved. The debt is paid. One of the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection is propitiation, a price that satisfies. The, the sentence is served. You don't owe anything for your sin anymore. So all that we spoke about, like I spent, what, 30 minutes talking about all this sin. If you surrender your life to Jesus, it's like, well, then that just all goes away. Yeah. You don't owe it anymore. Propitiation. Here's another benefit. Expiation. It's a real word, I promise. It really is, exists. Here, the prefix ex means out of or from. So, so expiation has to do with, with removing something or taking something away. This means he didn't just put himself forward as a payment. He also removed the sin from us. He removed the guilt from us. The penalty is paid because he is the price that satisfies. And because of that, we are freed. The word expiation does not appear in the New Testament but it does accurately describe an aspect of the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. So, so not only does he, does he put himself forward and go, you know what, there's a price that needs to be paid and I satisfy it. He then goes, you know what, I'm also removing the sin. The sin that you carry, the guilt that you carry, I'm removing that. We see that in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 to 26. This means that you are free. It means that you're free to go. You're free. Not only does he say, no, judge, hold on. I will step in on his place. But then he looks at me and he goes, now you are free. 
You don't need to be here. You are free. And, and the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. This freedom is not just from the, the clutches of death to eternal life, but, but it's to experience the abundant life in all facets of life. And it's crazy how like some of us, we, we, don't, even, we don't even realize that. We don't recognize that. We're, we're, like, we're like, we're liberated people, but, but our emotions and our, and our, and our wallets and our, and our ambitions, all these things are still stuck in Egypt. We're like living in the promised land, but we're still thinking, oh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh said I can't do this, so I can't do it anymore. F Pharaoh said I can't be this, so I can't be this anymore. If the sun sets you free, then you are free indeed. That's why Moses sprinkled the blood on everything, to communicate that everything needed purification, your thoughts, your ambitions, your desires, your vision, everything. This blood needs to go everywhere. Sin is a comprehensive problem, and the atoning work of Jesus is a comprehensive solution. And then number three, and then I'll get out your way. Third benefit of the atoning work of Jesus is imputation. Imputation. See, in and through the atoning work of Jesus, we get imputation, which means you receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus. He, he, look, he doesn't just take care of the penalty. He doesn't just remove the guilt and then leave you in a neutral position. No, 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 friends. He gives you his righteousness on top of your now innocent, justified state. It, it's like this. Imagine. Imagine you have this great debt, right? You have, you have this massive debt. And then the CEO of the bank came to you and said, that debt that you owe us, you know, your personal loan, your vehicle finance, your bond, your student loans, and all that credit card debt that you have, well, we're wiping it all clean. How amazing would that be? Praise Jesus. We're wiping it all clean. You now owe us nothing. How incredible would that be? But, but here's the thing. You're still broke. <laughs> you're still broke. Like, it's great. It's like, this is amazing. I, I owe nothing. And it's like, you're free to go. But I have nothing. And as you're making your way out the bank, the CEO says, oh, hold on, hold on. Here's a hundred million rand. And here, take some shares. The bank's doing really, really well. You can have some shares. Some of us will be praising Jesus like you cannot be, like, you know what I mean? Like the worship dance that'll happen in the bank reception. That's imputation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, Christ takes my sin, my shame, my guilt, and gives me his righteousness. That's what grace is. That's what mercy is. And then, and then over time, that righteousness becomes my own. Like, I, I, can't, I can't get over the gospel because of that. That, that righteousness becomes my own. It's, it, it, it's like a coat that you put on, and at first it's a little bit too big. And you'll tell yourself, this, this isn't mine. You're partly correct. But you know what? I'm going to grow into it. Because that's God's desire for my life, is to grow into it. That's what we call progressive sanctification. That eventually culminates to glorification. That, that God is at work in you. If you're a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, that God is still at work in you. He doesn't just save you, but now he's at work in you to make you become more and more like his son. You have the righteousness of Jesus on you. 
And with that, you get all the benefits. That's why we say every promise in God's word is amen and yes in Christ. And it's for you. But the question is, will you believe? Let me close. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 to 18. Let me read these words in closing. It says, Every priest stands day after day, ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. See, Jesus' atoning sacrifice is so powerful that it guarantees the perfection of all those who trust and believe in his death and resurrection in both directions of history. And one day he will return. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For after he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After those days, the Lord says, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer offering for sin. And so friends, sin is a major problem. Sin is a major problem. But Jesus is a great savior. And because of him, because of his body broken for us and his blood shed for us, we now have peace with God and everything that comes with it. Will you believe? Friends, here at Root of Fellowship, we, we believe that we are called to respond to the gospel. The gospel demands a response. That we cannot simply hear words like this and go doesn't mean anything for me. You actually don't realize that you saying that is you responding to the gospel. And so will you respond rightly to the gospel? Here we respond in three ways. We respond by singing and in a moment we're about to do that. And I say we sing our faces off. We worship. Do, do you guys know that wor worship Worship is pre-moral and pre-rational. That means if you're hearing these words for the first time and you're realizing, wow, this, like this is my sin and this is how great Jesus is. Like I, I have yet to do good works, but I can still worship. I have yet to fully understand all of this. Yeah, and we want you to understand it. We call that discipleship. But it doesn't mean that you don't worship. We respond by singing. We respond by praying. And, and I know many of you, there's lots that you need to tell God about. And so we create spaces here for you to do that. We have a prayer corner dedicated for you to come and just get on your knees and cry out to God and say, God, I need you. You can come to the front and do that. In fact, after the gathering, there'll be folks who'll be here. We want to pray with you. God is not afraid of what you're going through. God is not even afraid of your doubts. So will you bring those to him in prayer? And then lastly, we pray by obeying. Let's not be foolish. Let's hear what he says and then let's do what he says. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to obey corporately. We're going to obey corporately by taking communion. The Lord's Supper. What Jesus calls the bread and the wine. And we're told to do this regularly, regularly in remembrance. What are we to remember? Everything we've just walked through. Why so much blood? Because of our great sin. And so every time we take communion, we're, we're being reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. On our behalf. As we take the bread, it's a reminder of his body broken for us. The perfect body because he lived the perfect life. And then as we take 
the wine or the juice. It's a, it's, a, it's a reminder of his blood, his blood shed for us. He says, this is the blood of the new covenant. Take this in remembrance of me. And so I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to ask that we obey corporately. And so we've set out stations. There's one here up front. And so maybe folks who are closer to the front that you can make use of this station. There's two more at the back, one in that corner, one in that corner. Would you just stand up and, and go and take the bread and, and take the juice, these, these simple elements that remind us of a supernatural sacrifice. And this is for Christians to partake in. That means that if you're not a Christian, then, then do not partake of this. But you know what? I want to invite you to do so by inviting you to the gospel, by inviting you to Jesus. That this might be the first time for you that you go, I'm recognizing the weight and the gravity of my sin and how I'm in desperate need of a Savior and His name is Jesus and I've just heard about Jesus and He wants a relationship with me. The gospel is both information and an invitation and He's inviting you. And so if you're not a Christian, I'm pleading with you, would you simply surrender your life to Him? There's no steps there's no form that you need to fill. All you need to do is to look to him and say, Jesus, I need you. How do I look to him? You look up and you say, I, I need you. Why do we look up? Because nothing here satisfies. And let us corporately remember that we are loved more than we could ever imagine because of the finished work of Christ. If you're in the parents' room, I want to let you know that there's a communion station for you right outside where you are. So just make your way out there and let us partake together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your goodness to us. You're a merciful God. You're a gracious God. You sent your son Jesus to come and live the perfect life that we should have lived, died the death that we all deserve. But the story doesn't end there. The story does not end in the grave. That Jesus, you rose from the grave, defeating sin, death, and Satan. And that right now, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. And you're interceding for us. You're praying for us. That your, your work as the high priest continues in that nature of praying for us. You pray for us by name. You pray for us by circumstance. You pray for us by situation. You are aware of everything we are going through. And so God, I pray that every single heart in here would just let go. Let go of the pride. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. Let, let, let go of all these ambitions that get in the way. Let, let, let go of what people think about us. Let's just let go so that we might be taken up by you. And so Holy Spirit, would you consume us you fill us. Help us to partake together. If it's for the first time, Jesus, we celebrate that life that's crossed the line of faith that says, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. Or whether it's the 10th, the 20th, the 50th, the 100th time, let us do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray.